Greetings, beloved. God is truly good. And now Family Community Church of Fresno presents Pastor Chester McGinsey. Pastor McGinsey is an anointed voice to the nations with a clear message, building God's kingdom and empowering God's people. Today's teaching will build you, strengthen you, and unlock some kingdom principles that will give you access to the life God originally designed you to live. You'll be challenged to possess the promises of God for your life. And now, please join Pastor McGinsey for this powerful and dynamic message. As you remain standing, turn with me to the Old Testament, 2 Samuel chapter 7. I would encourage you in your leisure to read the entire seventh chapter. I'll be referring to it throughout. But just to lay a context this morning, I'm going to read verses 18 through 22. Starting at verse 18, you will find these words. Then King David went in and sat before the Lord, and he said, Who am I, O Lord God? And what is my house that you have brought me thus far? And yet this was a small thing in your sight, O Lord God. And you have also spoken of your servant's house for a great while to come. Is this the manner of man, O Lord God? Now what more can David say to you? For you, Lord God, know your servants for your word's sake and according to your own heart. You have done all these great things to make your servant known them. Therefore you are great, O Lord God, for there is none like you, nor is there any God beside you. According to all that we have heard with our ears. I want to stop right there. You may be seated. And I'm closing out a three-part series this morning, giving thanks with a grateful heart. While King David proposal earlier in chapter 7 to build a house for God has now been turned aside. God's acceptance of David's desire is not denied. God takes the desire of David's heart to build Yahweh's house and sovereignly declares that he will build David an everlasting house. David's desire was to build God a house. And God turned that aside and said, no, I think I'm going to build you a house. While God had other plans for David's life, God has dramatically and astoundingly promised to respond to the desires of David's heart by making an everlasting covenant promise to him. It was with gratitude and awe that David learned of God's gracious plan for him and for his descendants. For he is now overwhelmed at the magnitude of this promise God has given to him. His emotions are tumbling over themselves, if you will, and trying to seek some form of expression. There is thankfulness, there is delight, there's gratitude, and yes, there is praise. God has super exceedingly responded to the request of David's heart and has done so in a way that far exceeds his wildest dreams. Knowing that only God could do it, David addressed him seven times as a dawning which means Yahweh's sovereign Lord. Now, you know the Lord still delights to honor those who serve him. Oftentimes we react to a negative response from God or in life in ways God never intends for us to respond. We then blindly ignore the numerous blessings that he has already lavished and continues to lavish upon us as we lament over our supposed loss. The way David responded to God's correction 
the new word from the Lord is a good example that many Christians ought to follow. I'm, I'm saying when you receive a word from the Lord, that may not go the way you want it to go. It may be a word of correction. God may say, in my sovereign will, I desire something else. I know the desires of your heart and what you desire is not bad in and of itself, but that's not the way I want to go. David was then overwhelmed with the sense of God's grace. He humbles himself before God and called himself the servant of God ten times. One writer states that his prayer of praise and thanksgiving acknowledges the sovereignty of God and the magnitude of this promises. The covenant that God had just established with David was now unconditional. All David had to do was affirm the word that was spoken and let God do the work. Oh, you didn't hear that. God had established a covenant, and all David had to do was to affirm the word that God has spoken, and then we may just sit back and let God do the work. Oh, I heard somebody's phone go off. Maybe, maybe you didn't hear it. All that David had to do was affirm the word of God, and not somebody's dream come, and let God do the work. So what we have here is David affirming God's word and pouring out his heart before the Lord and giving thanks with a grateful heart. Amen. Uh, King David is, first of all, grateful for the word of present promises. Uh, David's initial response to this magnificent revelation concerning the covenant of eternal kingship was to acknowledge and affirm the Lord's graciousness in bestowing upon him and his people. David is so overwhelmed, uh, all he can do in verse 18 is go before the Lord and sit and wonder. David has just heard God tell him the answer is no to his personal dream of building God's house. God states in verse 10, I have a plan to establish a center of worship, but not now and not by you. <laughs> You're not going to fulfill your dream. I'm going to honor you nevertheless. Because such a noble dream is a part of your heart, but it is not part of my plan for your life. David does not question the veracity of Nathan's prophet's visionary words spoken into his life. No, he don't question it, no. He accepts it and he affirms that they're coming from the Lord. Yeah, I'm here to declare today, when you know that you're receiving a word from God, you know when that word is for you. God can speak it through the TV screen, through a movie you're watching, all of a sudden a word just drops out of the screen. Nobody else heard what you heard, but if God drops a word from the preacher's mouth, your kids can come in with the word, Mommy, did you know? Amen. And all of a sudden you're not realizing that was a word from the Lord. He requires no further confirmation of God's will. He goes and in humility sits in the presence of the Lord. Then, in wonder, he asked, why would you allow me to be part of such a grand plan as this, God? There is a genuine sense of humility. David picks up on God's reminder that he had taken him from the sheepfold in verse 8. And he raised the question many reflective Christians raise in their mind, who am I that you have brought me this far? Sometimes it does good to reflect upon what God has brought you from. Amen. Sitting before the Lord, David's mind ran back to the beginning to Samuel, another one of God's prophets who was visiting his father's house. And he remember when he was out there doing the sheepfold, they were trying to pour the oil on all his older brothers, but amen, the oil wouldn't flow, amen. But, but, but it was God that brought him from the sheepfold into the throne room. He was overwhelmed at the memory of all the good things which God had done from that day on to bring him to the throne in Jerusalem and to bring peace and prosperity to Israel through his life. One of our great temptations is to take for granted the blessings of God. 
It is good for our spiritual life to sit before God and just remember how far he's brought us. Amen. As I was preparing this, I had to think back to when I was a little boy. And, amen. And we had to go out into the great fields and cut grapes in order to have school clothes. Now, some of you can't say amen, but that's all right. But, amen, I know I wasn't out there by myself. It was a whole lot of us. Amen. God has brought us a mighty long way. We didn't have me, Visa and MasterCard and amen and amen and amen and amen. Who was that? A debit account. We, no, we didn't have any of them kind of accounts. No, we were broke. Amen. We were broken. But we had at a word that God put in our heart. Amen. That if we work hard, God will bless us on the other end of our work. Amen. I said, I don't ever want to forget how far God has brought me from. <laughs> As David sits in God's presence, he sees himself as he really is, and the king recognizes his weakness, his insignificance. It's something about when you get it. It's hard to talk about all of this and all that you are when you're really sitting in God's presence. It has a way of breaking you down anytime you get in front of God. Amen. When I read Genesis through Revelation, every time there's an idol set before God, it ends up falling over falling on his faith. I'm telling you, even idols, dumb idols have to fall on their faith. I'm telling you, when a child of God really gets in the throne room of God in prayer, you fall on your faith. You can stand up and pray all kind of pretty little prayers, get your little tonation just right, where you can go up and down and, mm, and put all that with it. But listen, if it's not in the throne room of God with humility, listen, it means nothing. You're just pushing air. You're like a dragon with hot, hot air coming out of your mouth. Thus, he is overwhelmed with the sense of gratitude of God's promises. It was God's grace that had brought David hey, this far from the sheepfold to the throne room. And now God has spoken about his descendants far into the future. I'm not just talking about you, David, but your descendants, those that will come after you. When you are lying in your grave, then you're going to have descendants. And the word that I'm speaking to you today, the covenant that I'm speaking to you today, reaches down through the years beyond your existence. Only as you and I realize our shortcomings. Can we be struck with the awe and the wonder that God would bless us and how he has blessed us? David had lived through a period of great uncertainty, not sure whether he would ever be king over Israel or not. And now he has the promise that one of his descendants would be king forever over that great kingdom of God's people. In verse 20, David acknowledged that he doesn't know what to say in response to God's present promise. Again, what more can David say to you? Uh, he says, you for you, Lord God, knows your servant. Here we have a poet, a songwriter who wrote most of the songs, a very verbal man. He has no problems looking for words and finding them. But here he is tongue-tied, silence, amen. Why? At, what? At God's amazing grace and God's amazing kindness towards his life and towards his descendants' life as well. But as he is being before the Lord, the realization of God's covenant promise, God's word delivered to him is being processed and sinking into a deeper level. Able to keep quiet no longer, he breaks out in praise and it flows through David's heart in verse 22. He says, for the sake of your word. According to your own heart, you have done all these greatness, amen, to let your servant know. David is overwhelmed, and he says, you bless my life, you bless my house, you promised to bless generations to come, you brought me from out leading sheep to this magnificent throne. Who am I? When was the last time we got to a prayer like that before God? Who am I? As opposed to going to God, saying, God, don't you know what I deserve? Don't you know what I'm entitled to? Don't you know what I'm willing to offer God's kingdom? No, no, no. But when you're broke down in humility and you look back over your life and you say, who am I? You know, it's important that every once in a while we sit down and take a good long look at our short lives. 
and just count our many blessings. Who are we to have been protected from the rain that fell, the mudslides, the fires that were burning all around us and thousands became homeless? Who are we that he has blessed our home and kept it safe, warm in the winter and cool in the summer? Who am I, oh Lord? that you should give me health and strength to be able to hold a job or pursue a career or go after a degree. Who am I? Or to have parents who encourage me along the way or to have kids to watch them up and grow. Who am I to be so blessed? With fulfilled dreams or no dreams, I'm a blessed person is what David is saying. David, first of all, is grateful for the word of his present promises. And then secondly, David is also grateful for the word of past provisions. David praises God's unparalleled sovereignty, which he had been evidenced, particularly in God's selection of the marvelous provisions that God has always provided for Israel in the past. Nothing helps your faith more than looking back and you worrying about where you are today and what's going on in your household today. And Amen. But look back and see what God has done for you in the past. How he has always provided for you. Always had provision for you. Amen. Amen. Growing up as a little boy, God always had provision, amen, for his people. In verse 22, he says, thanks and praise to God for he is as demonstrated by his works on behalf of Israel and David. He says, for this reason you are great, O Lord God, for there is none like you and there is no God beside you according to all that we have heard with our ears. Praise be to the God who has revealed himself down through history, particularly Israel's history. God alone is God. He's God all by himself. God needs nothing from me in order to be God. God needs nothing from me to make him a stronger God. God is God all by himself. There is no other true God. There is no one else like him. He, he's not a common God. He's not one of many God. He's not Confucius God. He's not Harry Krishna's God. No, no, no. He's not even any other religious God. He is God, Yahweh, Elohim, all by himself. He is the great and awesome God. There is in accord with that that they heard of him and from him. All of this is in accord with what they have heard from him. God has done great things for David, but these were not done just for David and David alone. God has worked in David and through David's life to bring about fulfillment of his promised provisions to the nation of Israel. Verse 23 and 24 recounts the greatness of God as revealed in his acts on behalf of his people. David has now emotionally recovered sufficiently enough what, to compare the God of Israel with the God of other nations as he places God's gifts to him in a historical context. David understood that these promises and provisions had come to him and his descendants that Israel might benefit from them. In other words, God didn't just give these provisions and these promises, amen, just for any reason, but he gave them on behalf of the people. God designed, it has always been, that through the nation Israel, the whole world would be blessed. God is the Lord of all nations, but he did a great thing for Israel, his chosen people. David recognized the wonderful truth that God had chosen Israel to be his people forever. And he was grateful for the word of past provision. And then as you would suspect, thirdly, he was grateful for the uh, providential word of future care. 
Then David prayed that the providential care that God had promised might indeed be fulfilled to the glory of his own holy name, so that his name may be great forever. In verse 25, David begins to lay before God the providential care promise that God has made to him. He says, now therefore, O Lord God, the word or thy word that you have spoken concerning your servant. Thy word, Lord, you know what you said about me just earlier. You, it, thy word and his house can confirm it, Lord, forever. And do as you have spoken. God gave through his word a providential care promise. David believed it and prayed for the Lord to uh, fulfill it. When the Lord promises something to us, mm. he expects us to confirm that we understood it and then remind him of it. When the Lord promises something to his people, he expects his people to confirm it, that, he, that they understood it and then remind him of it. Now, amen. Now, I grew up with three boys in the house. And when I made a promise, they had no problem letting me know they understood exactly what daddy promised. And they had no problem reminding me, even though it may be six months away every day, Daddy, you promised. Amen. God promises were never meant to be wasted, but to be used. Whenever God gives a promise, if a man does not use that promise, that promise fails in effect to that man. Listen, and God's great intention now is what, in some measure, frustrated. Amen. When God sent the providential care promise to his people, he desired for them to use the promise. If you receive a treasury note, that note is good. Amen. It says the U.S. Department of Treasury on that note. Amen. It's got a certain amount of money listed upon it, the value of that note. The Treasury Department has an expectation that if you have that note, you're cash it in and use the value of that note. Now, I don't know about you, but I don't have to wait till I get to the bank to start shopping. <laughs> when I get the note in the mail, and I got it out the envelope and I look at it, there's no cash on there anywhere. There's no real value other than a piece of paper. But the word that's on the paper so I got a certain amount of value in my name. And all I got to do is go cash in the note and get the value. But I'm here to tell you, I'm running around the house for no cash, but a treasury note. I'm here to tell somebody today that God's word is a treasure. You may not get that until you way home. You can't cash it in right now. But it's a providential care of Almighty God that went to David and David's ascendants and all the believers of Almighty God, that God will take care of you. It's providential. That means it's preordained. It is destined for you. It's got your name on it. It's God-given. It's divine in its origin. Take it and use it. My dear brothers and sisters, all too often, we don't cash in God's promissory notes. Amen. Nothing pleases God more than to see his kids get happy when they receive the note of his word and then put it into circulation. I said nothing pleases God much more than when he delivers his word, his promise, and the children of God just hearing the promise get excited about the promissory note and then get busy putting it into circulation. He loves to see his children. Amen. Amen. Bring them up to him and say, Father, fulfill your promise. David desired no more of God's word. And he expected no less. Even though it was disappointing to David that he wasn't allowed to build God's house, he focused rather on God's will instead of his desire. And he learned the, a verse that amen wasn't even written yet. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. 
That's what our prayer ought to be. Your will be done. Nothing more, nothing less, and nothing else. Amen. Sound like a real good prayer to me. And then finally, David was grateful for the word's presence. Presence. The thrust of verse 28 is the accepting of God's will and the final plea that God makes good on his true word. Now, O oh Lord God, you are God. Your words are truth, and you have promised this good thing to your servant. You see, as soon as David got still long enough, he received a word from the Lord about his own life and his descendants' destiny. As soon as David got still long enough, he received a word from the Lord about his life and his amen, descendants' destiny. That word said, you and your descendants are going somewhere. Has anybody got a word from the Lord that you're going somewhere? Do you really believe that you are on your way somewhere? That God is on the inside of you, moving you and directing you through his word because you're on your way somewhere? Has anybody got a word that has pointed you towards something greater than what you already have? Has anybody got a word from the Lord that stirs your faith, wakes you up in the morning and carries you through your day. Somebody ought to be able to tell your neighbor, 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 I got a word. I got a word. You need to understand something. They got a word of destiny that assures them of his presence with them. I'm, I'm going through life, but I'm not by myself because I got a word. Somebody said, I heard a word, but I couldn't find God anywhere. Well, let me tell you something about that. When God gives you a word, he, right. he drops a word down deep in your spirit. It carries his presence with it. God doesn't send his word without himself. Right. Do you not know that he is the word made flesh? Hey, uh, when you got the word down on the inside of you, you got Christ down on the inside of you. Now, I didn't say that it would always make you happy. I didn't say that it always make you feel good, but I said it would always carry his presence. You do remember that Moses once said, if your presence goes not with us, then do not take us up from this place. His presence and his word are inseparable. They're together. Now be careful here. Amen. I don't care how religious it sounds, how appealing it is to your flesh or your desires. The first thing you better ask yourself, this word that I'm hearing, does it carry the presence of Almighty God? Amen. Just like David, I've discovered that the word carries his presence and the power to carry you and keep you. I said, just like David, I've discovered that the word carries the presence and has the power to carry you and to keep you. Amen. David got a word from God's promise, from God's provision, from God's providence, and God now is giving him a word of his presence, and all this is to assure him and his descendants of their divine destination, in other words, called destiny. Do you know where you're going? Do you know where you're going? Do you have a word of God that's leading you there? The word makes you unsinkable. Amen. You've got to learn to hold on to that word when God gives it to you. I said, you got to learn to fight and hold on. When God gives you a word, he drops it down in your spirit. You need to know the devil going to do everything he can to take your word out of your heart, to make you look a different way, to hear something different, to see something. Listen, I didn't say that the word will guarantee you that you will listen, that your life will be easy, that you'll never go through a storm. No, 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 no. I said the word will carry you through the storm. The word will carry you through the storm. The word will hold you up. The word will make you unsinkable. Amen. Let me tell you the truth. I wouldn't be here today if I had not received the word from the Lord. The enemies would have killed me, but I had a word. Death would have sunk me, but I had a word. Family turmoil and strife would have capsized my vessel, but I had a word. Attacks on my integrity, on my character, would have drowned me in the sea of despair, but I had a word. Depression and fear and anxiety would have swallowed me up, but I had a word. I'm telling you to hold on to your word. Your word makes you fireproof. Your word makes you invincible. The word makes you unsinkable. You've got to take the word of God that God personally gave to you and push it down into your spirit as deep as you can go. 
Bible. Get somewhere and sit still and be quiet. Make sure you understand it. You affirm it to God that I got it. Because I remember there was a time in my life where I had to cry out on Isaiah 43 and 2. Anyway, and I personalize it. It says, Chester. I said, this is my verse. Chester, when thou passest through the water, I will be with thee. And there will be they shall not overflow thee, Chester. And when thou walk up through the fire, thou shalt not be burned. Never shall the flames kindle upon you. Amen. It was my job, amen, to affirm the word that I understood it and then sit down and watch God through faith work it out in my life. Amen. I'm telling you, I got to think it for myself. Like my two-year-old granddaughter, my granddaughter said, it's mine, it's mine. That's my verse. Don't you mess with my verse. That's my verse. Amen. It's down in my soul, down in my spirit. See, because the devil came and said, Chester, Chester, you're going to die. The doctor's report is incurable. It's terminal. But I received the word from the Lord that says, Chester, you shall not die. But live and declare the work of the Lord. I'm here to tell you today, here I am. I'm still alive and I'm declaring the work of Almighty God. I'm telling you, drop the word down in my soul. Amen. The word of the Lord said in Isaiah 53, but he was wounded for Chester's transgressions. He was bruised for Chester's iniquity, and the chastisement of Chester's peace was upon him, and by his stripes, Chester is healed. It's the word in my soul. You can't touch my word. That's my word. I've got I affirm it, and I declare it. I declare the word of Almighty God. I'm healed in the name of Jesus Christ. The devil says, you'll never see those children say, you're just wasting your time praying for them. You're never going to serve, they're never going to serve the Lord. But I heard a word. I heard a word. I know it don't look good right now, but I heard a word. I know it's tore from the floor, but I heard a word. I'm breaking out of wedlock. Hey Amen. He out there on drugs. I, know, I heard a word. I know what I see, but I got to learn to walk by faith and not by sight. I got to go over what I heard from God and not what I'm seeing with my natural eye. I heard a word. I heard a word in Isaiah 54 and 13. And Chester, all thy children shall be taught of the Lord, and great shall the peace of thy children be. Oh, bless your holy name. All oh, my children, my children, my grandchildren, my great grandchildren, my children are even born, descendants to come under the McGinsey name. And I even born, are covered, covered by the covenant blood of Almighty God through the Son of Jesus Christ. I declare the blessing. I affirm the blessing. I follow God. Here you are. The devil heard your word. Don't listen. Don't fool yourself. I said the devil heard your word, and he knows that you're on your way somewhere. That's what he keeps, amen, that's what keeps me moving, is that I know that I'm going somewhere. I'm not going through all this storm for nothing. I'm not putting up with all this hell for nothing. I'm not walking through the valley of the shadow of death for nothing. I'm not going, amen, putting up with all this stuff for nothing. But because I know I'm going somewhere. The fight isn't about who you are. I said, the fight is not about who you are, but it's where God wants to take you. The fight is about your word, your destiny. Amen. What God wants to do in you. The fight is about where you're going and amen. What God is getting ready to do in your life and through your life. But let me hurry and wrap this thing up here. You do remember Joseph when we talked about an earlier and earlier version of this thing. Amen. The brother of favor here. But amen. His brothers wanted him dead. Not just because he was their father's favorite, because he had faith, but because he had a dream. He had a word. He had a destiny. He had a future. You see, I've discovered as long as you don't have anything, <laughs> don't want anything, really have no dreams, no vision, no passion, no aspirations to go anywhere or do anything, you got a whole lot of friends. But as soon as as you start dreaming of a better tomorrow. Amen. And you start leaning and learning on the destiny through God's word, and your dream gets bigger than your friends can see. It gets bigger than they can handle. They try to discourage you and talk you out of your destiny. Amen. If you 
it won't sell out and you won't forfeit your dreams and settle back into, amen, the little slog that they want to put you in of a life of mediocrity and just religious expectation. Then you become a threat to them and they'll turn on you and we begin to try to destroy you. You need to examine some of your friends today. Some of you got too many friends. You're bragging about how many friends you got on Facebook, how many followers you got on Twitter. You better find out what they're really thinking about. Amen. Amen. Everybody can't go every place God is trying to take you. You ever see it? I mean, the space shuttle trying to go out into the orbit. They got what they call the, the booster rockets and the main rocket to shoot that thing out there. Hey, Amen. The booster rockets only go so far, then what? They drop off. They drop off. Sometimes in life, folk will just drop off. Amen. But you got to understand because they can't go where you're trying to go. God's going. trying to take you someplace. Hey, Amen. They, they can't go that far. They only go so far. Then don't get mad at them. Don't throw no shade on them. Just let them drop off. It's all right. Amen. Amen. Because when you get it made up in your mind that I'm going to serve God no matter what. Amen. You need to amen, check on your friends to make sure they believe in the same God that you believe in. I heard somebody say people are either win in your sails or wait around your neck. You better hurt and find out which one is with. Believe me. If you ever set out to do anything for God, and if you ever be bold enough to launch out, amen, and try to work out your own salvation and to walk it out your destiny with God working in you, you're going to be attacked. You're going to be attacked physically, spiritually, financially, emotionally. There will be attacks against your marriage, attacks against your ministry. It's all right. Just know that it's part of what's going to happen. Joseph was anointed of Almighty God from the very beginning. Joseph was favored by God. And repeatedly the Bible says, and the Lord was with him. The Lord was with him. The Lord was with him. Why? Because he had a dream on the end. Where did he get that dream from? God's word spoken to his heart. Well, if the Lord, you say to me, well, if the Lord was with him, if he had a word down in his heart, if he had all this God stuff with him, then why didn't God stop his brothers from stripping him and it was beautiful coat that his daddy made for him and throw him in a pit? Hey, don't you hear people say that? If God is with you, why are you going through all the stuff that you're going through? Amen. Why didn't God stop Potiphar's lustful filled wife from destroying Joseph and destroying his character and his integrity in the eyes of Potiphar and his whole house? Why did God let the butler forget Joseph for two long years after Joseph interpreted his dreams and it came to pass was God sleep was God on vacation what you need to know is this God allowed all that stuff in Joseph's life and to mature Joseph to become the man of God to, amen, to be able to stand under the dream that God had for his life somebody here today you need to hear that you're going through all kind of mess and you don't understand why you're going through it sometimes God allows you to go through stuff to break stuff off you amen to strip things away from you amen so you can learn to stand up with enough moral character and integrity to hold up under the dreams that God really wants in your life. If he gives it to you too soon, you lack the character. You lack the integrity to hold on to. How many people have you seen? They make it what we call too fast. Amen. It doesn't last. But when God works on you, I've discovered that, amen, the devil raises people up just to watch them fall. But I, God sometimes takes people down in order to raise them up. Every high rise you see must be the skyline in New York City. The higher that high rise is, the lower they have to dig the foundation. Right. I guarantee you. Sometimes right. we got to go down before we go up. Uh. You ought to give God a hand clap praise right about that. Amen. Amen. So God allows things to happen. And so when God gave Joseph as well as David the word of their dreams, the dream never changed. I said when God put the word in Joseph's heart as well as David's heart, the word, listen, never changed. The dream never changed. The word of God remained the same. But the dreamer, I said the dreamer went through a process of stripping and refining to bring him to the place that they were qualified to live out God's dream. You need to tell your neighbor, neighbor, I'm going through it right now. Neighbor, I'm going through it right now. But I'm in process. But I'm in process. You ought to give the Lord a hand. I pray for about this. I'm going through it right now, but I'm going down. But as soon as God gets ready in the fullness of time, he's going to turn around, and I'm going to come back up. Some of you I'm talking to right now have felt like God, amen, has just went to sleep and let the devil have his way in your house, with your descendants, with your kids, with your career. Amen. It's just like, it's just a mess. And you know it's a mess. And you're tired of denying it. You're tired of trying to put a happy face on it. No, it's a mess. It's a mess. 
be intellectually honest with yourself. It's just a mess. To tell the truth, it looks like, it feels like you're farther away from your word than you've ever been before. But the Holy Spirit sent me by here today to tell somebody, I don't know who it is, maybe your neighbor, to tell somebody that God is not asleep and he has not forgotten about you. His eyes are still on the sparrow and his eye is still on you. Amen. God is not asleep. He sees you every second of the day. He knows every hair that's on your head, every pain you have in the bottom of your feet. He knows everything about you. He's watching you as you go through the process. He's watching you as you go through the process. He's been in charge of the temperature that's in your life. He's been in control of the wheel that you've been spinning on. He has. He saw the storm coming even before it got to you. And he filtered that storm through his hand of love and it's through his hand of mercy. Why? He predetermined that this storm was not going to kill you. He predetermined that this storm was not going to sink you. He predetermined that this storm was not going to destroy you. Before you ever entered the battle, he predetermined that you have everything you need to be more than a conqueror. You had everything you needed to come out on top at the end of the day. I wish I had some folk in here who believe the word of God and can hear the word of God and receive it. You're going through the storm of your life, of your finances, and you need to believe in the word of God. You're going through the greatest fire of your life in your health, but you need to believe in the word of the Lord. You're going to fight for your children. Amen. It seems like they're further away than they've ever been, but you need to get a word and believe it with all your heart, with all your understanding. You see, you've been tested in your ministry, in your character, in your reputation, in your integrity. You've been attacked, but you need to believe in the word of God. It'll hold you up when everything else is falling around you. But I don't care what the enemy is doing in your life today, trying to do. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter what the storm or the test or the trial may be. It doesn't matter how hot the fire or how high the flame. It doesn't matter how deep the water is. The one answer to all of that is the same answer. Hold on to the word of God. Hold on to the word of God. Church, get back to your word and hold that word in your life. Your word will get you through it. Amen. Don't dare leave this morning without getting the word of the Lord in your heart. Amen. God says, amen, if God is not man that he should lie, but amen, nor man that he should repent. Hath he not said, shall he not do it? Hath he spoken it, shall he not make it good? Take that word and make it a weapon. Take that word that God speaks into your heart and make it a weapon. Don't get out of here without having a word. Amen. Take the word and make it a weapon. God didn't give you the word just to make it a soft pillow for you to cry all night long. No, no, no. no. He gave you the word to fight with. you got to stand up as a good soldier of Almighty God. Take the word of God and weaponize it. It's the sword. It's the word of God. And as soldiers of Almighty God, pick up your sword. Pick up your weapon and give thanks with a grateful heart. Matthew 24 that heaven and earth shall pass away, but thy word shall not pass away. Thy word, O Lord, is pure as the silver tried in the furnace of earth. Amen. Purified seven times. Forever, Lord, thy word is settled in heaven. Church, get back to the word. The word is sharper than any two-edged sword. Master, we've toiled all night, and we've taken nothing. Lord God, I, I heard the preacher talking about we toiled all night. Amen. In the Bible, I just reading the word, trying to find a word from my heart, but my life is still messed up. God says, go up there and cast out on the other side. Mm. He said, but, but, but Lord, we know this area out here, there's no fish out here. Cast your nets on the other side. Somebody gave me, somebody got to believe the word of God and say, as the disciples said earlier, nevertheless, I know it doesn't make sense. I'm looking at the situation. It just doesn't make sense. I've got the bankruptcy papers in right here, and you tell me to go file for a house. How am I going to get a house with bankruptcy papers like that? I know what it looks like. It's bad, but nevertheless, I'm going to go down to the bank. Amen. Nevertheless, I'm going to believe in God no matter what. Nevertheless, let down your nets. Amen. Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. You better get you a word. Before I was afflicted, I went astray. But now I kept thy word. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Order my steps in thy word. Let not the amen, the iniquity have dominion over me. Free me from all the traps of the devil. How does that happen? It's through the word. Because whom the sun sets free what is free indeed. indeed. Somebody better get a word and put it in their heart. You worry how you're going to feed these babies? Hey, man, the man that walked out for left it. How you going to keep food on the table? I've been young and now I'm old. Yet have I not seen the righteous forsaken or a seed begging bread? You better get yourself a word. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. You better get yourself a word. You better get yourself a word. Hey, you better get yourself a word. Everywhere, every time that rises is different. Thou shalt condemn, for well, this is the heritage of the saints of God. You better put a word in your heart. And when the word is in you, you abide in the word, and the word abides in you. You can ask for two, and it shall be done. Well, because Almighty God is on the inside of you. The power of Almighty God is in you to deliver you. The power of Almighty God is there to make you strong and to stand up and be the leaders in your household. And all souls of Almighty God, give the word of God and declare the truth of Almighty God. The devil is alive. The devil is alive. The devil is alive. The devil is alive. Get your hands off my children. Get your hands off my house. Get your hands off my job. Get your hands off my 
Thank you for joining Pastor Chester McGinsey for this powerful teaching. Family Community Church of Fresno is empowering millions of people around the world through dynamic preaching and teaching, humanitarian aid, and many other ministry efforts. For additional information and resources from Family Community Church, please visit www.familycommunitychurch.com or call 559-323-5002. We look forward to serving you in the kingdom.